talk and we will now move to the next talk uh, by uh, uh, beatrice uh, olmos sanchez um so beatrice uh, yeah you are sharing your screen okay so uh, the talk uh, is titled uh, dynamical phases and quantum correlations in an emitter waveguide system with feedback uh, yeah you can please proceed Okay, just give me a second to familiarize with my environment, but I'll be there, I promise. Um, okay, okay, there you go. So I hope everybody sees my screen. I think that's one of the most repeated sentences in the last year, uh, and that everybody can hear me, otherwise you would be complaining already. So yeah, hello everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm hoping to entertain you for the last four, yeah, next 40 minutes. Uh, thank, all, uh, thank, of course, to the organizers for giving me the opportunity of giving this talk here and for inviting me to this, give this talk. It's really yeah, a pleasure to hear uh, all the talks. And uh, although, unfortunately, I'm going to have the co to confess that I have only been able to follow the second part of it, being the rest during nighttime for me. Um, but OK, um, also, in particularly, I am pleased to be uh, the second Spanish uh, woman in this uh, in this uh, in this particular uh, part of the workshop. So, and uh, we seem to be all kind of into quantum optics. So we kind of stay in quantum optics. So let's see. I'm going to be talking to you about I came from, here from Tübingen uh, about dynamical phases and quantum correlations in an emitter waveguide system with feedback. So there are a few things that we have already heard here. And there are a few things that we haven't. So I know, for example, that dynamical phases and quantum correlations are already, yeah, have been discussed in length, but maybe a meter waveguide system is not so much in feedback as well. So I will anyway, even if I have to repeat a bit uh, some concepts that people have already touched upon this uh, in the last yeah, talks, I think it's uh, worth uh, going through them again. So um, I will be discussing things that, uh, yeah, having published in, okay, they are currently under review in archive. You under review, this one is actually going to be already published. Uh, just a second, I want to use my pointer somehow. There you go, exactly. So this one is already um, accepted to be, and will appear soon in the Journal of Physics uh, yeah, in Josa B. And then this one you, you can see already in, in archive. And uh, finally, I wanted to, before I forget, uh, to say that uh, I am looking for a PhD student. So if anybody yeah, has a good idea of a PhD student that might yeah, like working on this kind of uh, field, I would be very happy to hear from them. You will see the, yeah, the advert soon in, uh, in the usual Eraxis and um, Quantiki platforms. Um, okay, so enough of publicity, let's talk about physics. So this is the outline of what I'm going to be talking about. So first of all, Look, I'm going to be talking about open quantum systems. So even though we have all heard about how to formulate them and everything, and we have heard master equations for the nth time, I will still familiarize you with my yeah, own take on a notation and so on, so that we are in the same yeah, field. Then I will be talking about feedback. Uh, this is maybe something that is not has not been so touched upon in the last few talks. So yeah, I will explain you what I mean by feedback. Then um, I will be talking about waveguide quantum optics. So this is, yeah, in a way, it's very similar to uh, cavity quantum optics, but a little bit different. So I will be talking to you about yeah, how this system behaves. What is this system at all? I mean, this is uh, already a sketch here. So you have a bit of a spoiler here. But I will explain you exactly what I'm, I want to talk about. Then I will explain you how we have taken this system and we have analyzed this in a specific setting. And in particular, we have been looking at the observables in the thermodynamic limit. And this in, the, in this thermodynamic limit, we have been studying the dynamical phases that one can reach in this uh, system. We show you some phase diagrams. And also we have been talking, yeah, we, we, we have been studying spin squeezing, spin, spin squeezing. So how you can actually get spin squeeze states uh, in this kind of system using uh, feedback. And then I will end up with a small summary. So please do not hesitate to stop me at any time. I prefer to be stopped during, and if we don't have any questions at the end, it's also fine. Okay, just, yeah, I don't want to lose you at the beginning. Good. What's the setting? So the setting is this one. So this is uh, a very uh, simple schematic setting. So this is just a system. 
and then parameterize the system here by some parameter alpha, nothing yeah, serious so to say, just some parameter that just to say that this is parameterized. And this system, which will be atoms, um, it's yeah, embedded in some bath, which will be the radiation field. And uh, well, and then we can have a detector, and then we can, for example, if this is uh, yeah, atoms emitting photons, as we have seen, so for example, in the in the talk by Elena, for example, right now, then again, you can detect these photons, and then yeah, you can analyze the light that comes out, and you can see yeah, several things on this, of this light. So far, so good. And this happens basically because there is an interaction between the environment and the system. And eventually, you can write some sort of equation that describes the dynamics of the system. Now, the new, so to say, um, ingredient that I add here is the feedback. So, well, first of all, yeah, we go to the steady state. So we wait for long times and we will be analyzing in this particular talk. I will be talking mostly about, I will be talking about some time evolutions, but, but particularly I will be interested in what happens in the stationary state. So now what happens is that now I add a feedback. And what is this feedback? Basically, for example, I have a detector and that detector is taking, as I say, in the case of photons and atoms, I'm just taking photons of the, of the light that is coming out of the, of the atoms, for example, and I'm analyzing them in some way. And now I'm taking that information and I'm feeding it back uh, to yeah, these parameters. So I am changing the system according to what is coming out of the system in order to control it or to yeah, control the dynamical phase, or in order to control, for example, the output of the photons, etc. Okay, so this is basically a yeah, very generic scheme of what feedback means here. More specifically, as you can see here, I will be talking about uh, yeah, a, a waveguide, and this will come in a second, so a nanofiber, and then you have many atoms nearby, and uh, so what happens there is that the atoms emit, the photo, emit photons into the waveguide, they can be detected. And I will tell you in a second how I can then do homodyne detection, take this uh, signal as feedback and then change the laser that is exciting these atoms constantly and then yeah, get something out. Okay, so this is basically just a very quick schematic. Now the second ingredient that we need then, okay, once we have this, uh, this system, we want to know how to uh, and, uh, yeah, how to write down an equation for it. And basically what we want to do is yeah, to write a Lindblad master equation. You have all heard about this a thousand times, but again, this, I will be talking about the limit where everything is Markovian, more Markov approximations, dipole approximations, etc. And then what we obtain here is just a density matrix row, which represents the degrees of freedom of the atoms only or of the system only. And then you can write it in the most general possible way, so to say, you write it as some minus i times a commutator here and with some Hamiltonian. And this represents the coherent evolution of your, of your system. And then you also have this second part here, which is a dissipator. Basically, this deals with the incoherent evolution or, the, for example, the incoherent emission of photons into the environment, etc. And just for notation purposes, Note that, okay, we have this, uh, yeah, this sandwich term, which is just this uh, quantum jump term. Okay, this is how I would call it now. We have these LJs, which are the jump operators. So this is the yeah, emission processes we will be uh, talking about later. And whenever I use this the annotation D of the jump operator applied to rho, I will be talking about the dissipator. So every time I, yeah, I, I use this, so to say for short, for every dissipator that I will be using. Good. See, typical example, the simplest, so to say, example. And this, again, yeah, comes back to what Elena was talking about before. You have a resonantly driven or yeah, a driven two-level system yeah, with uh, some spin down and spin up, if you want, the ground state and the excited state. And this is yeah, driven via laser. And this laser can be written as some Hamiltonian. This Hamiltonian is the one that goes here in this incoherent evolution. And you have some omega times sigma x, and sigma x is just yeah the spin um, yeah sigma x basically the Pauli matrix. So you this describes kind of yeah Rabi flops between the ground and the excited state and vice versa. And then what happens is that if you couple this to the environment and you trace out the environment, what you observe is that you have a, yeah a, a dissipator whose jump operator is simply this L. And this L is just the square root of kappa, where kappa is the emission rate from the excited to the ground state, times 
the jump operator, which is, yeah, the jump operator, so to say, per se, which is this sigma minus. And the sigma minus, as you can see here, represents just going from the excited to the ground state. So literally just this represents just the emission of photons from the environment, they go from the atoms when the atom is in, this, in the up state, goes down, emits a photon, and that's uh, the kind of thing that we are looking at, okay? So this is kind of a, the prototypical example of uh, yeah of this kind of Lindblad equation. Now comes feedback. So what happens now? Okay, so I take the light that comes out, and as I say, I I use it. I analyze the light in some way, and I will show you here two ways of analyzing this light. And then I take the information, and then as a consequence, I make some instantaneous feedback loop. So I change something in the system as a consequence of what I'm getting. More specifically, one can do, for example, photon counting. One has some yeah, system, it's emitting photons, and then I have a detector that just makes a click every time it uh, a photon comes into the, into the detector, the simplest way. And then this is supposed to be just some trajectory. So to say, as a function of time, you have a click every time you have a photon being emitted. Now, if I want to write, then um, I can write actually out of this a master equation that describes a feedback, okay? And then this feedback is going to be the following. Every time I have a click, what I do is I take my laser and actually I make some rotation of the atoms according to some feedback uh, strength. And this feedback strength, I'm going to be calling it G. In particular here, basically, as you can see, this, yeah, what it does basically is that the laser performs a, yeah, a, a, a pulse of area G every time there is a, uh, a photon coming into the into the detector. And actually you can, as I say, if you want more details, you can, I mean, this is kind of uh, relatively standard. You can see it, for example, in this in this uh, book here, Quantum Measurement and Control by Weisman and Milburn and a number of papers that uh, talked about how to do this in practice and how to obtain out um, an effective uh, master equation that describes the system. Basically, you can actually describe this feedback mechanism by just modifying the jump operator. Now, instead of having a jump operator that is L, actually what you do is you perform a unitary evolution, yeah, a unitary transformation here, this exponential of minus ig sigma x. As I say, just, yeah, as I say, uh, it's just um, yeah, uh, a pulse with area g. And yeah, you change this jump term like this, and you obtain out uh, your master equation that can describe your system when you have done feedback considering photo, photon counting. You can do something more complicated. For example, you can do homodyne detection. So what you can do here is you take the light that comes out from your system, you do homodyne detection, and then you measure basically out the photo current of uh, what comes out. And then this photo current, for example, here in this example that I'm putting here, just as I say, just for illustration purposes, here we are measuring, for example, the amplitude of the emitted electric field. And then this is just uh, this amplitude, you take the amplitude and then you do it here. This is really continuous feedback, so to say, this is not yeah, as before, when you have a click, then you make the feedback. This is really just continuously happening. And then depending, of on, on the signal that you get as a function of time, you modulate the Rabi frequency of your laser in each time step. So your Rabi frequency actually, when you have the feedback on, changes to the Rabi frequency plus this G times square root of kappa times the amplitude of this electric field times ET. And, and this, as I say, proportional to the photocurrent. And okay, I give you here the, yeah how the photocarbon looks. There is some noise here, there's some, some white noise uh, with uh, mean zero. But the important thing for us, as I say, if you want details, you can you can look them up in, in the literature, is that then you get a modified master equation out of that. And that modified master equation is the following. You have the same master equation that you had before. It's just that your Hamiltonian changes to be from the original one to the original one plus this over here. So you add an extra term, which depends on obviously on this uh, feedback strength, which I call G. Okay, every time I say G, I will be talking about feedback. And then also the, the corresponding jump operator changes from being whatever it was to L minus I square root of gamma G times 
sigma plus uh, plus sigma minus. So this is again, yeah, it's just a modulation of the laser as a function of time, depending on the amplitude of the emitted uh, electric field that is coming constantly from the system. So this is kind of still all very generic. Let's go back to exactly the, the point um, that uh, the system that we want to analyze. And this is an atom chain coupled to a waveguide. A waveguide, in particular, I will be talking about a nanofiber, but it could be basically a lot of things, okay? So what is this system? Well, this system basically con uh, consists on a nanofiber or a waveguide, which is, for our purposes, is just something that can, uh, that can uh, transport only two modes one that goes to the right and one that goes to the left. What happens when you have a chain of atoms that are close to this waveguide? What happens is that instead of having just two levels, so these are two level systems again, okay, ground state and excited state. So when you're driving the system, uh, the, the atoms with some laser field, this is a periodic array, you can see that the nearest neighbor distance is called A. What happens is that if you drive this with a laser field, there will be, four, yeah, there will be excitations and then these excitations will eventually decay. Now, this decay can happen either to the unguided modes in the environment or into the, one of the two fold, uh, modes of the, of the nanofiber. These are going to be called guided modes. And even more interestingly, this emission into these guided modes can be chiral or in order to use a more logical way of calling this, you can break chirality of the emission, which means that depending on the specific polarization of your atoms and depending on many things, on, you know, on the distance to the surface of the nanofiber and other parameters, what you can do is you can make that the system actually emits more favorably to the right than to the left or the other way around, actually. So this is why these systems are kind of yeah, forming the what people are calling yeah, chiral quantum optics out there. So, and why these systems? Well, these systems have two main <laughs> interesting things I find. One thing is that they are relatively, relatively simple to treat analytically because the modes, the guided modes, as you will see in a second, are yeah, relatively simple to treat. At the end of the day, they are just yeah, a plane wave that goes into one direction or a plane wave that goes into the other direction with a very specific uh, wavelength. Okay, which is corresponding to the one that, that can propagate in the medium in the nanofiber. That's one. And the second one is that these are actually things that yeah, are being done experimentally. And okay, here I just name a few uh, people that are um, a few groups around the world that actually work with these kind of systems. In particular, I mean, we have been working together with uh, Arno Rauschenbeutel's group with uh, Philipp Schneeweiss. So, Let's go back to theory. Uh, what is the dynamics of the system? How do I describe this? Again, I have a master equation. As I say, so far, no feedback, okay? I will add the feedback in the next slide. So the dynamics of the system is just yeah, this row dot. And then I have here a number of things, a number of Hamiltonians, and then a number of dissipators. So one by one. The first term here represents the laser driving. Now the laser driving means that I'm driving constantly this uh, this chain. I'm actually driving it such that I'm perpendicular to the la to the to the lattice, just uh, for yeah completeness. I say this, and then I'm doing it with a Rabi frequency that is being uh, that it's omega, and you can see this is just omega times sigma x, as I said before. It's just sigma plus plus sigma minus, and then in in general I could have the tunings that could change from one atom to the other. Later on, we would see that I don't need them, but okay. In principle, this is the more generic way. And then I have this HL and HR. These are actually coherent atom, atom interactions that are mediated by the proximity of the nanofiber. So this represents actually virtual photon exchanges between two atoms that are near the nanofiber. What is particularly interesting about this is the shape of these uh, Hamiltonians. As you can see, this is just this e to the power of minus i k x minus x l. So the interesting thing about this is that they don't seem to, they have a dependence on the distance between them, but it's more like a phase dependence. It's not really a dependence on the, di on, on the actual distance between them. So 
the strength of the interactions of these coherent atom atom interactions between the first and the last atom of the chain may be the same as the, the one that you have between two atoms next to each other. These do not decay with the distance, okay, which is a typical thing that happens when you have atoms, for example, um, coupled to the radiation field without the nanofiber. Okay, so this is uh, one thing. So as you can see, these are also proportional to this sigma, yeah, sigma L, the gamma L and gamma R, which are the decay rates of each atom into the right and the left eigenmode. But again, these are just yeah atom atom interactions that are mediated by the, the guided modes. Also, by the guided modes, you also have incoherent uh, emission. Okay, so this is what I brought here. Okay, so this is this G, this D as I promised before. We are going to use this. So this is D, and this is the jump operator that occurs, and this is just applied to rho. So you can see that I have two. Excuse me. Uh, excuse me. So what is the dispersion uh, of these uh, waves in the uh, this uh, nano mode, this nano fiber? Sorry, can uh, you repeat? Uh, what is the dispersion relationship for these uh, modes in this fiber? Uh, the uh, uh, yeah. But this yeah exactly no I mean the 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 way that the Green's function and everything yes, looks yes. is, just, is yeah. literally just this is is this exponential of minus i k x. So there is no, as I say, there's just, yeah, there's only one possible K that, uh, oh, see, that see, is coupled. Yeah. Okay, yes. okay, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, and then, yeah, you have this emission property, yeah, incoherent emission from the environment, you know, from the atoms into these guided modes. And these jump operators are collective jump operators, as you can see here. They are extremely collective because they actually, they consider, yeah, they, they need to, yeah, they take all of the possible single atom uh, jump, so to say, uh, operators, so these sigma j is minus, and they are just, you know, multiplied by this e to the power of plus minus i k x f uh, uh, x j, and these are, these x are actually just the, yeah, the positions of each one of the atoms, so these are extremely collective decays, okay, so all the atoms, so to say, are involved in each one of these decay processes. Finally, there's this extra thing, which is the emission into the unguided modes. Actually, this one is completely the contrary. This one we consider to be independent for each one of the atoms. So each one of the atoms emits photons into the environment. As you can see, okay, the difference that here you have a sum over many different yeah, dissipators. And here you have a dissipator whose jump operator is a sum of all the single atom degrees of freedom. So these are very, very different processes, okay? And yeah, this is kind of the whole picture that we have. But we simplify our problem because uh, it's not simple enough. Um, we actually look into a simplified setting that has been also studied in, in the literature a couple of times. So one of the things that we will consider is that there's no decay into the unguided modes. This can be added, okay, and one can actually see that the yeah the processes might or might not be robust depending on which ones you're looking at, with respect to adding these unguided modes. This is actually important to be able to add this to these unguided modes to see that because I mean if you eventually want to yeah do these things experimentally, you are not going to be able to just remove them. But we consider for the sake of simplicity at the moment the the decay uh, we neglect the decay into the unguided modes. Then we also consider that the atomic positions are commensurate with the photon wavelength. Why is this important? Look, remember that everything depends on an exponential of i, k, and the, the position of the atoms, or the distance between two atoms. Now, if, if the distance between two atoms is always 2 pi, then obviously you have a very specific situation because all of your, all of your exponentials are going to be 1. And then you have a very, very specific situation. This very specific situation is the following. Okay, first of all, you can now, now in that uh, limit, write the Hamiltonian as, okay, this could be done anyway before, as this uh, Rabi frequency times J plus J, J dagger. So this J is just the what I'm going to be calling the collective jump operator. It's the only jump operator that's going to be appearing from now on. So this collective jump operator is just the sum over all J's of all the sigma minus uh, j's, okay? So all the ladder operators going down, all together, this is going to be my collective jump operator. This is basically a decay model if you want, okay? 
So then you still have some uh, the tunings and your HR and HL that were before there. Now these exponentials kind of, as I say, have conspired together to, to give just ones. And then you can actually write the, the two of them together and you obtain something that looks like this. So the interactions in principle depend on the difference between the emission to the left and the emission to the right. Okay, so this is this delta gamma is just a, it's a way of calling the, uh, the chirality of your system. If this is equal to zero, it means that you are equally probable, every time you emit a photon, it's equally probable to go to the right or to the left. And if this is very different, uh, then you have chirality, so to say, or you break the chiral symmetry. We are simplifying this even further by saying that I actually don't have any chirality. So emission is uh, equal to the left and to the right. And I'm going to be calling them actually gamma R and gamma L will be actually just one gamma divided by two. That's it. And also I'm going to be considering that there is no detuning. Okay, so I have a very, very simple Hamiltonian. My Hamiltonian is simply just the one given by the right frequency of the laser. That's it. But now you also have the other part, the, the, dissip the dissipative part. Okay, I'm sorry. And then this dissipative part, if you go back a second, sorry about this, you can see that, okay, we have gotten rid of this, right? And now we have said that all of these exponentials are going to be one. So as you can see, these J, L and J, Rs are just going to be the Js that I just defined before, okay? So this is going to give me a very specifically yeah, very symmetric uh, form, and you will see that in a second. So now we have to add feedback. So we have a very simple master equation that we can solve, but now we add feedback. What kind of feedback? So what I say is that the photons emitted into one of the modes. So this is a very minimal model at the moment, right? So what I have is a laser field that is driving the atoms. I have, we have plotted this kind of cloud around it because uh, the atoms are just acting as a one collective mode, this given by this J, okay, this over here. And then they emit with the same probability to one side and to the other, but I'm only going to be analyzing the light that, uh, that goes into the right. Okay, so the left is kind of, yeah, by itself, the, the, the right is the only one that I'm going to be, uh, just a second, because I'm afraid my son had called me. I hope not. <laughs> Okay, so then, okay, I have, uh, in that feedback is going to be the following. I'm going to take the light and I'm going to analyze it. And that light, is we are going to make a, hom a homodyne detection scheme again on it. And I'm going to be, take the P quadrature of that light and that is going to be what is going to determine my feedback, okay? So out of the P quadrature, depending on the, on the, on the measurement of the V quadrature, I'm going to be changing my laser accordingly to uh, the feedback mass equation that I showed you before. And if you do all of that, what you end up with is this master equation. And this is actually the one that I'm going to be using. So this, this feedback master equation has a few things that I haven't really defined so far. First thing that I haven't defined so far is that I'm, I have written everything in terms of these JX, JYs. You all know these uh, operators and we have, I mean, they have been already presented a number of times in this conference. These are just the collective spin variables, which are just this J alpha, where alpha can be X, Y, or Z. And then these are just the usual Pauli matrices. Okay, so this is just, yeah, these collective spin variables. But the good thing is that now, yeah, you have a master equation that depends all on those uh, operators, which makes it also relatively, yeah, much easier to handle. Now, importantly, we have a feedback generator, a regenerated interaction term. As I promised before, your, the Hamiltonian changes according to this feedback, okay? And that change in the, in the Hamiltonian leads me to this term over there. So you can see that G, when G is equal to zero, I recover my equation in the absence of feedback. The second thing that is also changed is the jump operator of the photons going to the right, okay? So I know that it's hard to distinguish them now because they have the same rate in front of them. It's this gamma over two, but this used to be gamma R, okay? So with this gamma R, you have this dissipator and this is the jump operator. As you can see, this is what has changed, this jump operator. It used to be just Jx plus Ijy, and now I has acquired basically this two G plus one in front of it. 
And as you can see, there is no change in the jump operator of the photons that are going to the left. Okay, so that jump operator is uh, is left unchanged, unsurprisingly, because we are detecting photons on the on the right. So this is my master equation, and now this is uh, what I can solve. How am I going to solve it? I'm going to go actually to the thermodynamic limit. I want to know what the phase diagram of this system looks like. I want to know how the different variables, the jz, jx, jy, and so on, change as I change omega and as I, so the, the Dravi frequency, and, I, and also as I change the feedback strength, which is this uh, g. How do I do this? Well, I define these magnetization operators. These magnetization operators are just, are just these collective j's divided by n, which are good things so to say to to take because they become classical in the in the n in the n going to infinity limit. So they, they become kind of bosons, okay. And actually, in this limit, the mean field description uh, of the expectation values of of these magnetization um, operators becomes exact. And just one more change, in order to have a well-defined thermodynamic limit, as you usually do, for example, in the lit in the Dicke model, you have to rescale this gamma to be just some gamma divided by n. So you have to put a one over n in order for the yeah for for everything to be well behaved in the thermodynamic limit. So mean field. Now we do mean field, and we can write actually we can take this whole master equation and actually take out. Yeah, all the, how the expectation values of the magnetization operators look like, and you end up with something that is relatively simple. You have these three equations of motion for the magnetization. Later, even more, we will be interested only in the stationary state, so then you can actually solve these three algebraic equations, basically, and obtain the dynamical phase diagram in the stationary state. Note that I have made an extra change here, this kappa, this is the 2g plus 1. So whenever I have kappa equal to uh, minus 1 over 2, that means, uh, well, sorry, that doesn't matter because I'm going to plus everything in terms of g. So it doesn't matter. So that's just my feedback parameter. And again, just to reiterate, these equations are actually exact in the thermodynamic limit, which is something that was not shown before. And uh, recently, it was yeah, shown here in this paper. So what's the mean field? So I do solve these equations and I look at the magnetization in the set direction and I look at it in the stationary state. And what do I get? Well, I get the following. Look, I'm here I'm changing two things. I'm changing the driving strength, omega, and I'm changing the feedback strength, uh, which is parameterized by G, okay? They so say at G equals zero, I have no feedback, but then if I yeah, go this way or another, I, I get, yeah, yeah, feedback. What do I observe? The first thing that I observe is, look, there is a area here in this yeah, parameter space where I have a time crystal and another area where actually I have a stationary phase. What do I mean by that? Let's look at the stationary st stationary phase here, uh, first. What, I, what happens here is that if I run my parameters and I look, for example, as a function of time, and I'm here now in this square here. What you can see is that I start my, my I look at the magnetization as a function of time and eventually it goes to a stationary state. Okay, this is in the infinite limit and you can see that here I have also, we have also done uh, simulations for different atom numbers. So N is just the number of atoms in my chain and I go N 20, uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 and you can see that as it should be, uh, the, actually the, the values are going closer and closer to this infinite limit, which is just the mean field uh, a limit. So the thermodynamic limit. That's the stationary, the stationary phase, that's fine. But then I go, so to say abruptly, from that stationary phase to another phase, which I call a time crystal. Why do I call it a time crystal? Look, if I look at, the, at how the M set, uh, how this magnetization in the set direction behaves as a function of time, what I obtain is that this actually in the stationary state also, just oscillates constantly. You don't get to a stationary state actually, which is why I mean here, I, uh, yeah, the choice of color, I mean, we have chosen zero because it's kind of the average uh, value of the of the M set, but as you can see, it doesn't go at all to a stationary value. This is literally just, yeah, something that evolves in time kind of continuously. 
And this is what we call the time crystal phase. And in the, in the middle, you go from one to the other. Um, note that there is something else is that, okay, when you have a yeah, limited amount of atoms, so 10, 50, okay, so this is li literally just taking the full mass equation and calculating the, the M set, okay, without having to me it or whatsoever, you take that, that equation and then you evolve it in time and this is what you obtain for 50 atoms. And you can see that there, you don't really, you actually do go to a stationary state. This is at this damping, so to say, the, the damping of these oscillations gets smaller and smaller, this, the larger the system size. And actually this can be measured in terms of the spectral gap. And you can see, for example, that uh, this is the scaling of the spectral gap. So you can see that in the crystal, in the time crystal phase, yeah, in the time crystal phase, that spectral gap goes down and down and down and eventually goes uh, n, where n is, this, is the number of atoms. So it's smaller and you go into the, eventually into this phase that oscillates always. While in the other in the other phase, in the stationary phase, what you have is this yeah this yeah, this scaling of the spectral gap does not depend on the system size at all. It's always constant. And finally, just yeah, for you to see, we have made yeah, we made this uh, this cut here, and you can see that this in the stationary state, indeed, you see that the scaling is also correct. You get yeah for n atoms, you get kind of a crossover. But eventually, if you go to the to this uh, in, uh, thermodynamic limit, what you get is really yeah, literally just yeah, a transition, a sharp transition between one uh, phase and the other. This is what happens to the stationary state of the average of M set, and then you can also look at M Y and M M X. But now we went a bit further, and we want to look at the fluctuations. And now, yeah, for the sake of, yeah, I don't know. I was going to skip this, but I, I think I can also talk about this. But in order to look at the fluctuations of the system, so I want to, what I want to do is I want to study the squeezing. I want to see if in this system you can actually have spin squeezing. In order to, and why? Well, the, the reason is that the spin squeezing, if you have, for example, a state that has spin squeezing, yeah, you can have, you can, uh, it has been shown that you can use the states for quantum metrology and et cetera. So it would be nice to have also this, yeah, a state that has these kind of properties. In order to study this, it's not completely simple. You need to you, uh, you look at the fluctuations. You cannot look at the averages anymore. You have to look at the fluctuations in the thermodynamic limit. And to do that, you have to define these fluctuation variables, which are just this H, J, X, J alpha, so Jx and Jy and Jz, minus uh, their average value. And you have to put this one over the square root of n so that, again, everything is well behaved in the <clears throat> and going to infinity limit. Then you also have to define this covariance matrix. And what happens is the following. So as you can see, the fact that I have put this square root of n over here tells me that the commutation relations in the limit of n going to infinity are also going to be well behaved in the sense that, again, these fluctuation operators are also going to be bosons. OK? So the, yeah, the flu yeah, the, you will have this basically going to 0. OK? And this S um, matrix it's just going to be yeah, this over here. Now, what I would like is actually not to have this uh, covariance matrix in this direction, in any direction. What I want to know now take, I mean, this is a bit technical, but okay. What I want to do is I want to actually take this covariance matrix and uh, turn it, so rotate it, such that my, my set direction is uh, in the yeah it's in in a given direction okay so I, what I want to do is I want to yeah rotate it such that J set is actually a classical direction which means that J set in this direction commutes with the other with the other two directions so that I have one direction that is this J set that commutes with the other two and then I have the other two the F X and F Y in that limit okay that uh, obey co um, canonical commutation relations. That's a lot of, I don't know, information. But at the end of the day, what I want to do is I want to be able to describe spin squeezing. And for that, I need some sort of, yeah, I, I need these two uh, canonical, uh, I, these operators that have obey canonical commutation relations, which I call X and P. These are the typical ones, OK? And these are going to be this Fx and Fy 
I mean, this is actually not a great idea. This is not supposed to be J set. This is actually supposed to be F set. Okay. So I rotate my system such that it goes into this direction so that I have one direction that doesn't matter and the other two that yeah, commute with, uh, the, that have these commutation relations. Why do I do all of that? The reason is that I want to uh, calculate the squeezing. And in these spaces, I can actually calculate the squeezing parameter. And this squeezing parameter will be the one that is giving me the minimal variance in the XP plane, okay? So I can now take my covariance matrix. I take my smallest eigenvalue and that will be the spin squeezing parameter. And that spin squeezing parameter will be telling me that if it's equal to, it's larger than one, there is no squeezing. If there is smaller than one, there is squeezing in your system. This is how I measure my squeezing. Now, what do I see? So this is my squeezing phase diagram. And it's, yeah, you have, okay, this is exactly the same as before. I have the omega here, I have G over here again. And then I have this time crystal phase and the two stationary phases. The first thing that one sees here is that finally the two stationary phases even though they are both stationary for the for the for the M set, okay, for the averages, if you look at the fluctuations, they are completely not equivalent. Because in this phase over here, the one where G is larger than minus uh, 0.5, you actually enter a squeezed phase. What does it mean? That I have a phase, which is a stationary phase where there is a squeezing, spin squeezing. While on the other side, um, there is no spin squeezing, even though you are also in a stationary phase, okay? Also in the time crystal phase, there is no spin squeezing. But now, another thing that one observes is that if you look at the finite size uh, scaling of this. So what I look at now is at this spin squeezing, okay? And now I look again at the same three points that I was looking before. First, I am in this stationary phase where there is spin squeezing. As you can see, as a function of time, the spin squeezing goes from one to, brrrp, to a stationary value, and that stays there. If I am in the time crystal phase, actually, my spin squeezing just grows as a function of time. There are some oscillations there, but, 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 there, but you can see that it just grows and grows and grows. That means that there is no squeezing in your system. While exactly in the middle, this is the interesting part, you can see this uh, dot here. Here, actually, uh, you get the maximum value of the spin squeezing. And you can see that it actually goes down as a function of time as one over t as a function of time, okay? So it really kind of goes, drops basically to zero exactly at the boundary between the stationary phase and the time crystal phase. And this is just to show you some, yeah, again, some finite size scaling. You can see that it goes yeah, from equal 10, 20, et cetera. And it goes more and more into the thermodynamic limit where you can see that you have this phase, which is corresponding to this phase over here, where your squeezing parameter is smaller than one. Then you have a minimum, which is exactly at this point over here. And then you grow uh, all over up. You can see that, okay, here the squeezing is just larger than 1.5. It just grows and grows and grows. And this is what you can observe also here. And this is, you enter a phase that is not squeezed. Good, so with this, I, I'm in the summary. So I hopefully showed you that, okay, these atom waveguide systems yeah, can host a time crystal phase, which I mean, we found already pretty cool, that the feedback actually can control the phase, this phase transition. If you add feedback, you can actually even go into a place. For example, if you look at here, you can go into a, into a place. If you put G equal to minus 0 0.5, where you only have a time crystal phase, you don't have a stationary phase at all. And we have used these uh, fluctuation operators to yeah, see that there is actually yeah, squeezing near this time crystal phase transition. And with this, okay, I leave you with some outlook. Okay, this kind of promises yeah, co correlated quantum matter on demand in an integrated system. So this is, a, again, kind of cool because these are things that could be in principle done in experiments. And of course, one has to consider also this, uh, the role of the emissions into the guided, unguided modes. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Beatrice. Um, so are there any uh, questions? Can I ask one? Manas? Yeah, sure, sure. Go ahead. Hi, uh, Beatrice. So Hi. Uh, one question uh, regarding these, uh, the, the feedback master equation that you wrote down finally is uh, unconditioned, right? So you've sort of removed the uh, stochasticity completely. 
uh, it's averaged out. Sorry, can you repeat again? I didn't hear you so well. Oh, so, so the feedback master equation that you have finally yes. doesn't have any stochasticity. It's averaged over trajectories, right? Basically, so, yeah. 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 So, so, so I was wondering, is there also some interesting, um, like like the ones that uh, you guys have been talking about from Nottingham, um, you know, in the trajectories, how does this phase diagram look? Will there be some other interesting phases for such a system? Uh, because, or, I mean, or is there look, nothing interesting there? Yeah. You, you mean if you look literally just at, at each one of the trajectories individually? Or, or the statistics of the trajectories or something like this? It might be, I don't, I don't have a good answer like right now for that, because, okay, this is kind of early days. I don't know exactly what you would see there. Okay. And 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 uh, then uh, one more thing was, can, so this time crystalline phase, eventually this is because of some kind of a dissipative transition, right? So you have actually a degenerate set of um, multiple degenerate steady states or how does it work? Yeah, actually, um, you can see also, I mean, as I showed before, I think it, yeah, right. it was slides ago that yeah the, right. the spectral gap there actually it goes to zero basically so it goes as one of a uh, it closes and closes as a function of one of a n actually so in the in the thermodynamic limit your spectral gap is completely closed yeah but again uh, some symmetry strong symmetry or something that you can identify for why you get this uh, I mean, or... we are working all the time with this very extremely symmetric kind of uh, system because we are talking about a system in which we have basically one degree of freedom, if you want. Uh -huh. so we only have one jump operator, so it, that might be important. Yes. Okay. Or right. thanks. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi. Can I have one question? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, like, uh, is there any reason, like, why you are not, uh, uh, like, computing these quantities using uh, holstein Primakov? Uh, well, they are already kind of, I mean, okay, they are treated as bosons. It's just that you do this when you go into the thermodynamic limit, right? So they are really bosons, if that's what you are um, referring to. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I meant, like, uh, uh, I can start with, like, uh, uh, Representing spin operators using Holstein Primakov, and I can start working with them. Uh, the problem so is that you have strong driving. Uh, momentum operators as such. The problem is that you have spins, and then you have strong driving. So you are okay. As far as I understand, maybe I'm wrong, but okay. I, I usually, whenever I use Holstein Primakov appro approximation in this kind of system, is because I'm assuming that there are very few amount of excitations in my system. But here, you cannot really assume because, as you can see, my omega, my driving. Then, yeah, it's actually strong. So in, in, you, the, the hosting Primakov approximation there would break down. The spins still have the spin commutation relations if you want. You cannot really, I don't think that you can use this. Oh, so, so this is a scaled uh, magnetization, right? So, so that's what you're saying, it's greater than one. So, okay, okay. okay. Yeah, it's scale yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, we are running very late. Uh, so thank you, Beatrice.